Welcome back to another episode of a podcast written by Software Engineer. I'm your host, Perry, and today we're going to be talking about coding boot camps. Um, it's actually a pretty good topic because nobody has really used this term until like the recent years. And even calling it boot camp, like you would imagine something like physical activity and all that, but it's totally the opposite. It's nothing like that. It's basically mostly about, you know, being able to learn how to code and doing it in a timely matter of time. So I think it's a really interesting topic. And today I'm joined with Andy and Stan. Yo, Stan, how are you doing? I'm good. And you, Andy? What up? Yeah, what up, Pete? Um, it's actually really cool because um, it's really prominent nowadays just because, like, from our experience, right, working as software engineers for the past couple of years, we've had many opportunities to meet people who have gone through uh, coding boot camps, uh, whether it be working with them, whether it be interviewing them, or whether it be just, you know, going to meetups and talk about it. But what's really cool as well is that, Andy, you yourself, you're a product of one of these so-called coding boot camps, which is why it's going to be so interesting to have your take on, you know, how do we do it? How does it work? And, you know, the benefit out of it, uh, which I think it's the most important part for a lot of people listening to this, that like, is it going to be worth it to join these boot camps? Because there are costs to it and, you know, stuff that you got to weigh before actually doing it. So yeah, thanks for being on the show, guys. Yeah, just like to start with is what exactly is a coding boot camp? So I, I guess one of the first questions would be like, your, your impression. I think like there's a technical definition of it. There's something that we all agree about a coding bootcamp is. But I think for you, Stan, like what would you define a coding bootcamp? Um, I'd probably define a coding bootcamp as an accelerated program. Oftentimes, that's a substitution for like a traditional like uh, a tr traditional like computer science degree. Um, of course, like the scope of what they learn at coding bootcamps generally is very different from. <laughs> Uh, what a computer science degree generally gets you, mm -hmm. but I think the overall objective of both usually is to find a software engineering position uh, somewhere in like the tech the tech space. Okay, that makes sense. So yeah. just like a quick comparison, that'd be like the sometimes shorter version of full university degree, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of take a lot of like the more practical aspects of what you need to do in like an actual software engineering position and probably consolidate their curriculum around around that. Oh, that's pretty sick then. And uh, yeah, for you in terms of like how you perceive what a coding bootcamp is, Andy. I would say that I see coding bootcamps as kind of like a vocational school to become a... Um, like a front end or a back end, like a uh, web developer. Yeah, that's actually really, really interesting because uh, when people call it like vocational school and all that, I know it's the same in the US, but in Canada, we have these like different concepts of when you graduate um, your high school, some people go into like a, you know, a university degree. They call it a DEC over there, Diplôme d'Education Collégiale, which is a colleg collegiate degree. And then there's another one that's available. It's called a DEP, which is a Diplôme d'Etude Professionnelle, which is a professional degree. And this is like the separate separation between like doing a comp side degree, which is like, you know, the collegiate one. And then the other one is basically like just do a professional degree in programming. So that's like definitely more hands on. Or if you want to be like a blacksmith or if you want to be some some like somebody like a professional baker, that, that, that'll be the equivalent to it. So I think we could all agree that this is what we're seeing at the moment is that if you want to go to the academic, fully proper academic route, is that you're going to go into a computer science degree. But then... Um, the other option is instead of going through that path, you could just search up these boot camps, coding boot camps, and then it will be considered a professional degree where by the time you get out of it, you, you know, are directly able to do kind of the same thing, but in a different uh, path, which is what I still don't understand is that like at the end of the day, you're still going to be able to become a you know software engineer, you're going to be writing code day to day, but there's so many benefits that you've probably listed before, Stan, you were saying that most of them have shorter. Uh, and something that people might find more, you know, attractive is that it's practical as opposed to just theory at the end. So mm. I definitely want to make like break down in terms of why do we get two paths going to the same thing. So um, the other thing that is interesting in terms of defining what a coding bootcamp is, is uh, what types of bootcamps are there? Uh, one of the points that Andy, you brought up already is uh, web development bootcamp. So as opposed to a web bootcamp yeah. uh, compared to like, for example, an iOS bootcamp or whatever. Mm. So what exactly would be the topics you would find inside of a web bootcamp? Oh, um, yeah, it, it's just basic, like, um, front-end and back-end work um, off of, like, most popular stacks. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And when you're saying most popular stacks, that they're, they're really emphasizing on using, like, a usable modern technology, right? Yeah, basically just what's what's used most in the industry. Like, um, what, what, what you can do most on the job, basically. That's actually really cool, because, like, it really imitates, like, you know, life-to-life -life kind of thing. 
um, for the different like application app, applicants, sorry, from like different boot camps that you've seen since then, were most of them like web developers, or has some of them just have like a general like they've they've done like a Java boot camp or they've done uh, you know some socket app language boot camp, and then they just apply for like different jobs, and one of them happened to be like a web position. I think most of the people that have graduated coding boot camps that I've seen have all been like full stack boot camps. So they learn a little okay. bit of back end, a little bit of front end. I'm not sure if they ever specialize in one or the other. It seems like maybe individually they might prefer one or the other, but the boot camps generally like cover both ends of the stack. So front end back. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's like a misconception that I think I had this whole time was that like most boot camps are very specialized. In terms of like this bootcamp specifically, like a Ruby boot bootcamp, and this one is like a PHP bootcamp. Is that not what's happening? Like I, I guess in the Bay Area at the moment. I think the some bootcamps do they do teach like different stacks. So one may specialize in they might teach their students Ruby as opposed to another one will teach them like JavaScript, Node. Um, I think there are also iOS ones, but mm -hmm. they're relatively rare from what I've seen. Um, at least compared to the full stack ones, I think those are predominantly the ones I've seen in the Bay Area, at least. And I guess like those kind of always relate to like, it feels like they always relate to web development at the end. I feel like that's so prominent, which is why I've, I'd definitely love to take a chance to see if there's any like bootcamps like Scala, for example, like just like building like really socket apps on that. Um, what do you guys feel about like database bootcamps? Do they even exist? Is that something that was something that came across like a radar at some point or I mean they have boot camps for like data scientists or like data analysts so I feel like they would probably work a little bit more in databases but I don't think there are dedicated database ones because there are I mean it there there's kind of like a blur between like taking like an online course sometimes and actual boot camps like that's is the point. difference like oh you have to go in person to like a place and that's technically a boot camp versus just like an a pretty comprehensive online course. I mean, uh, there are some like, I definitely know there are a bunch of like online courses that revolve around like SQL and some of them like also SQL is just like a single module of the curriculum that might feed into like a larger like data science, uh, a data science, um, you know, curriculum. That's actually, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because which means that like these different building blocks, like when you take a, when you talk about like online courses, they kind of, you know, are, are blocked into uh, this, courses specifically on databases, courses specifically on UI if you're into that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But then like these boot camps, they somehow manage to tie these different pieces into like a flow that as you go on with the, the course, you probably learn these different parts and then that's why it's like a, a higher level where all these like packages are packed together and then they can offer that as boot camp. Was that actually similar to your experience then, Andy, when you did that? Yeah, the curriculum at Hacker Reactor when I went was actually pretty good. It was a decent mix of um, in-person lectures and kind of online exercises as well. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely pretty comprehensive. Um, I got to touch a lot of things. They had a big emphasis on algorithms because you need to know them to basically find a job in, in the Bay Area. Um, yeah, like the curriculum was pretty well spread out. It touched uh, everything. Um, which was good, but then it was bad because there wasn't really any specialization. So like you get a, get like a little bit of database work here, a little bit of front end work, but um, yeah, it was pretty good overall. Yeah, I kind of I kind of really do like that because uh, I think the follow up question that I've always had about these boot camps, or maybe anybody trying to look for one, is that like, do you want to go into a JavaScript specific boot camp, right? Something that's gonna be able to do that, or do you want to go? into a React specific boot camp, uh, boot camp, sorry, which is even more specialized because like it's a framework that you specifically know how to do. But I think the more we get to that part is that the more you realize that they should probably just go get an online course instead of a boot camp because those are so specialized at the end that maybe that's the different uh, <laughs> way of doing that. So, and then we touch briefly on the, you know, iOS boot camps, like mobile boot camps at the end. Um, I think my biggest concern there is that like, are they the same length most of the time? Like, I don't even know what's the normal length of a boot camp to begin with. So, for example, when you did the hacker rank one at um, at that time, how long was that program that you signed up for? It was um, 12 weeks, I think. And most of the ones in the Bay Area or like in the U.S., they typically are around 12 weeks. There are some exceptions, some that are half a year long, one year long, uh, two years long. But those are definitely like um, rare. Okay. 12 weeks. That's... Is it mirror that seems short to cover like a lot of uh, all the front end to back end stuff? What do you think's that? 
Uh, I think, <laughs> I think coding boot camps are kind of like a fake it till you make it type situation where they give you just enough to pass. They kind of train you to pass these interviews and they give you enough of a foundation to pass a lot of these web dev, like software engineering position interviews. But, uh, there's still a lot to learn <laughs> past the three, past the three months. I think even like among coding boot camps. A lot of people they still take a while after the three months to actually get a position, probably because they're still bolstering like their software engineering foundations even after the boot camp. Um, yeah, I think like for most people, three months, unless you're like extremely talented or kind of went in with a bit more experience, is probably a stretch from what I've seen in terms of getting a position immediately. After yeah, the boot camp. yeah, that's probably fair. Um, I think they try to compensate that by with the fact that it's a lot more practical. So what you do there is that. They try to mimic as closely as possible of a working environment. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it this way because some people that go into university, for example, because uh, I personally did a comp sci degree, and there's loads of technical aspects to it that are not always reflective to like a day to day life as a software engineer. So in terms of like the the proximity of what you do, what I do nowadays compared to my university life, there's a pretty big gap. As opposed to if you have somebody coming out of these boot camps, the gap is probably smaller. You know, they'll be able to probably do git do they even do git during uh when you did your boot camp there that's a big part of it yeah oh okay shout out to that by the way because i remember during uni <laughs> like we did git but there was not like the big emphasis of uh you you should know git like you know like the back of your hand um i think that's a requirement imagine somebody not knowing git nowadays like i'd be, <laughs> I'd be slightly worried um but also uh so we already brought up an example of like hacker rank has one boot camp were there other like prominent ones that um you've heard whether it be in the bay area or just around in the world yeah i think the uh other biggest one is probably app academy mm -hmm. like i think hack reactor and app academy app academy are probably the top two ones okay and do and is it like available everywhere or is it only available in the bay area or only available in the states or so i know hack reactor has a lot of um classrooms now because i think galvanized bottom out and they made hack reactors at every single galvanized building i think oh okay yeah but App Academy is a little bit more exclusive. I think they only have um, two locations, one in SF and one in New York. I'm not sure, though. I could be wrong. Right. So the things like it, it, there's this aspect of starting to be a bit more like exclusive. So when you choose a university, like that system has been well defined, right? Like a lot of people apply to different university and that system has been here for tens and tens of years. But then like even the word when I was saying coding bootcamp is like a newer term that we that process of being admitted to a coding bootcamp is not really defined. There's not the same application process for every single one of them, which uh, I think a lot of people, when they dive into this, like there's not as much history of how to do it. I think like, yeah, this is just a good transition to talk about like, how do you choose one and how do you even like start getting into doing one? So I think for, for a lot of people thinking about it, is that like, what would be a reason to join a coding bootcamp? you're looking for like a career change or you want to make more money yeah <laughs> i mean who doesn't want that at the end of the day it is it, it is kind of funny that like the the impression that like if you switch into tech you're definitely gonna get like salary bump i for some reason think it's still true today like there's gonna be a point where it's gonna be saturated where it's gonna not gonna be fully true anymore but i still think that like in what 2020 it's still a very prominent thing to think about or am i wrong to believe that no I think you're absolutely right. Like, <laughs> yeah, the demand for engineers is definitely very high right now in the Bay Area still. I do think like there are a lot more entry level people like coming from these boot camps and they're all kind of competing against each other to try to fill these entry level positions because a lot of a lot of companies they don't necess they want engineers but they don't necessarily want entry level engineers. So mm -hmm, I think yeah. it's it can still be difficult to get a position like just trying to break into the industry. It's also really relatable because I feel like a lot of stuff you just said, I've heard that the moment when I when I was about to graduate university. So yeah, I kind of get like the intensity and like the fierceness of the competition is there. And it's probably more prominent coming out of a program, the bootcamp where everybody has the same objective of um, getting straight into you know, a junior role as a software engineer. As opposed to if you go into the academic route, not everybody get, ends up becoming like a, you know, uh, R&D developer at a company. A lot of them might stick into school. A lot of them might end up doing more research doing some other private company that's, that doesn't really actually have a product that do anything. So I do get that the competition from a bootcamp 
make sense in terms of being a lot more competitive at the end. But um, overall, I think over the years, you've heard so many good stories of people coming out of those, you know, boot camps, which is why the appeal of it, people to do it, the reason to do it is that like, yes, get into tech, you're probably going to make more money at the end of the day, which is great. But also your skill to be able to be more flexible is like the pathway, the gateway to being able to do that. Um, what about some other reasons that people would go into this? Like, for example, I would you see somebody go into it just for their own knowledge? Like, for example, like an online course, if you don't know about AWS, people sign up for that just so that they're more knowledgeable about, you know, doing a AWS online course. Do you think people actually do that for boot camps? They'll sign themselves up for three months and uh, just for personal knowledge. Yeah, there was someone in my class that kind of did it for fun. He wasn't looking for a career change. He just wanted to learn stuff. But I feel like a boot camp is a poor option if you want to learn stuff because they are just so expensive. Like if you really want to learn stuff, it's better in a true academic environment, like going to an actual university and learn computer science there. That is a really interesting approach. Like even, yeah, how, how big was the, the class that you got into? I just want to have a sample size compared to that one person. One in how many people have that kind of mindset. Yeah, I think there was 20 or 30 people in my class. Oh, that's so significant then. Then you'd have at least one person in there just for like pure curiosity as like a human mm -hmm. knowledge kind of thing. Maybe he was rich. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was like an investment baker or something like that. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, that kind of explains a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, that's not the worst idea because you have like some people who want their free time to do volunteering and then some mm -hmm. other people on their free time wants to do this. So I think that's quite um, admirable. And if I ever want to do that, I've always said this, but like my free time, I'd, if I actually had any, it, it would be like, you know, finding like a gig and like doing extras <laughs> like on a set you know so i guess their equivalent is uh doing these boot camps <laughs> at the end of the day um and actually if we follow up with that is that like who are these boot camps for like let's describe the person the best candidate to go into it so i guess it's really about the mindset of if we're thinking about ourselves, why would we want to join a boot camp what do you think uh, that would kind of be descriptive of somebody in that position andy i mean the main thing is as someone who wants to be a software engineer Nice, yeah. So, um, like boot camps, to me, I see them as um, like there really is only one goal. I, I I don't think the goal is necessarily to learn about computer science or or pick up the fundamentals of software engineering. It's it's to it's the transition into being a software engineer and to get that first job. That's a that's a really good direct point that is concrete. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people end up doing that. Is that how you kind of see it as well, Stan? Or yeah, I would I agree with that. Um... Yeah, like people that really want to just break into software engineering, I think it's a good route. Um, boot camps, uh, it's it's a little more formalized than just taking like an online course with no real assistance. Mm -hmm. But um, and then there's probably like different levels to it. There's probably like an online course, like a coding boot camp, which forces you a little bit more to actually commit to that. And then if you really wanted to commit, maybe like <laughs> maybe you actually go to and get your bachelor's in like computer science or something. I think they're just like different levels of commitment towards usually something that's I like the that. goal being like software a software engineering position. I like uh, the, the way you kind of make it look like it's a flexible position. So not only can it be a stepping stone, but it's also something that you could just use and like go straight into a software job and then like doing that, if that makes any sense. As in, it gives you more option after doing it. Yeah, I think it's like, again, like on a spectrum, like different people might have different motivations. Like, it's not like you can't break into software engineering if you don't do a boot camp. Like, you could study yourself and you could do all these online courses and do your own projects. And I'm sure if you pass these interviews, just the same. Like, I don't I don't give like coding boot camp graduates like any extra points during an interview because they graduated from a boot camp. If they do well, like then they pass like the interview, then you then you offer them a position. Wow, you're so unbiased in your interviews. That's good. I'm kidding. <laughs> Why? You, you see Hack Reactor, you're like, pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that instant shit out. Yeah. <laughs> or it's more like, you get out of here. <laughs> Shout out to that. It's also good that, like, when you're saying, like, at least from these uh, boot camps compared to online courses, the credential you get out of it is that, you know, it's, it's a slightly higher credential. Not that it's going to affect it 100% more than the other one, but getting a credential from a boot camp compared to getting a credential from, or a certificate from a just this one online course is slightly better also the comparison of like just somebody having a degree in something is where like just another level higher of like the credentials behind it um that that university paper man like the, the amount of like blood sweat and tears you do to get that and then it actually helps like as much as i bash the whole university system like doing comp sci and all the theory behind it like 
it definitely helps you in the long run. So, um, but this episode is not about <laughs> university degrees. We're back up to the coding recap at the end. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of describing the person at the moment who are, you know, in the position of, yeah, they should do it. They should go do a coding bootcamp. Um, there are people that want to get into software engineering. What kind of background do they need? Can anybody from like uh, a literature uh, passionate person or like somebody who's, who's very hands-on and he's been, you know, uh, an artisan for the past years, like would those people be able to have this mindset to go into these kind of boot camps or? I think so, yeah. I think there are a lot of um, industries that aren't related to engineering at all, but still give like a, pers a like very unique perspective on engineering that could help them a lot, like random things like, I don't know, like someone with a English background could be very good at laying out logic in their papers, or like they can be very persuasive and that can somehow transfer into, into writing code. Yeah, writing code, I, I oftentimes think it's actually very similar to writing prose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, uh, it's like, there's actually a lot of, you can put like a lot of eloquence into your code. Like you'll see some people's code, it's messy and it does the job, but then you see some other people's code and like you, it actually like looks beautiful. Like it's easy to read, <laughs> like. Oh, you, thank you, by the way, I'll take that. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, like I think there are different aspects of like coding that a lot of people can identify with. There, of course there are like things that are more stereotypical, like you probably should be like pretty meticulous to be good at certain parts of like your engineering role, like. Um, like if you're debugging or something, you yeah. can't just like take like a broad view of like, oh, I think this is what's happening. Like you have to like be able to find the details and kind of investigate. But I don't know. I think there's a little bit of some something for like everyone in coding. Yeah, the way you yeah the way it was kind of put out is that like those skills that you uh, you describe being able to problem solve. Like it's not a fully like you got to know math so that you could problem yeah, solve. Yeah, you right? barely need to know math. <laughs> like how much <laughs> math anything, do you yeah. actually use? If anything, sounds like you don't need to know math. Though. That's yeah. not what it's going for. So it is kind of good that in the way we put it, it's like welcoming. You don't have to have a strong like technical, like I like numbers. I could do the 13 tables by heart kind of thing. Like it's not, it's all like that. A coding bootcamp is really just to dip your feet into it. But then like if you want to make it concrete, it's the, you know, the, the pathway of doing that. So um, I don't think it should ever be discouraged for somebody who doesn't have a background in any kind of engineering or tech or math or especially not math um, <laughs> to, to get into that. Um, did you know what kind of diversity you had in uh, the program that you went to, Andy, when uh, you said there was this group of people? W would you say like half of them were like technical backgrounds? So they did like, a you know, something previously related to uh, software or physics or chemistry or was it literally just a bunch of people like one example you had was like an investment banker was there any other like interesting ones of people with like different backgrounds doing that um i think everyone pr had pretty um random backgrounds i don't think anyone from my class had a technical background before but everyone had some sort of interest in programming before like whether like they tried an online course maybe years ago they kind of liked it or they took a class in college uh, back in the day and they enjoyed it Okay, and then that lingering feeling be like, oh, I remember touching a bit of this, and this is like the expansion of it. This mm -hmm. is just the point. And then they make it a full-time career, and then they probably love it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's true to say, like, every time I say, like, engineers love their job, like, for me, like, I feel like that's a very true statement for me. I'm not going to speak for all the engineers out there, but I think I, I yeah, love what I do. Yeah, for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like at the end of the day, engineers do like what they, they do at the end, so uh, I like putting it like that. And um, one of the major like hard part is that how do you um, decide which boot camp to join? So like it is an investment you got to do. Shout out to the investment episode we did the other time. <laughs> um, so you have all these options. Like number one, like how do you even find a boot camp? Uh, is it just Google or word to mouth? Like what what was uh, I guess the way you got to a boot camp to begin with, Andy? Well, I actually found out about my boot camp through a Reddit ad, and then it was it was through there that I did more research. But like. Um, yeah, it's, it's typically either word of mouth, I think that's probably the strongest, or um, or just research online. There's there's usually a lot of statistics online for each boot camp on um, how many grads get hired. And like they'll publish like median salary for the whole class. They'll publish, um, yeah, like um, hiring percentage, how long it took them. And you can kind of use those numbers to determine like which boot camp is truly the best. Those are like concrete metrics. Like it's it's so transparent that like it will and like emphasize if you want to make a decision on that um 
And do you think, like, nowadays, like, if given what, we're 2020 at the moment, do you think there's a lot of them? As in, like, did you find yourself in a position where you had to cho choose between 10, 20, 50? Or was it more like a university level where, like, you most of the time you'll have five of them and then, like, you'll just pick one of them? Like, what, what does the current landscape look like? In so back when I went to a coding boot camp in uh, 2017, 2018, there were only a handful of boot camps. But now I think there's probably 20 or 30, probably even hundreds, I think. So now it's a little bit tricky, but then it's still it's still good to just go off of like metrics or honestly, word of mouth is probably the best. If you had a friend that went through one of them and you got hired, then there's a good chance that, that yep. the same will happen to you. The, yeah, definitely. Do you get a referral bonus for referring somebody to a, <laughs> to a boot camp? Unfortunately not. <laughs> uh, I mean, well... We'll come up with an idea where we have this like referral system for boot camps and then like everybody benefits <laughs> it. I'm writing that down. That's fine. <laughs> I think there are a bunch of boot camps at like different price points and stuff in different durations and you kinda have to and whether they're online or in person and you kinda like factor in all those various differences between all the boot camps and you, you probably wanna narrow it down to like the like a group of boot camps that actually fit your needs, right? Some people maybe they can't actually relocate themselves to the Bay Area mm -hmm. to like do an in person one, and then there are plenty of online boot camps to like support that sector of people, right? That's actually a really good point. Uh, just because we already named a couple of factors, so we have the you know the metrics of the median salary or like the people graduating, mm -hmm. and now you bring in this other aspect of how long is a boot camp to begin with, how much does it cost, do you have to get a loan out of it, do you have to like make some other sacrifice to do that mm -hmm. at the end of the day? So these are really, I guess, a lot of different factors. And as I, I was saying that most of this information is available when you when you go online, I guess, like when you go through a Google search to look for that or like a, some ads to it. Those are public information that should be considered to, to do it. Um, was there like any other, you know, lesser common concerns when you when you had to finally pick one at the end? Or was it just, I'll apply for as many of them and see how it goes? I think... What I'm trying to say is that, like, were some programs harder to get in than other ones? Yeah, I think all programs claim they have, like, a 1% or a 0.1% acceptance rate, but I'm not entirely sure how that is calculated. But um, for I'm writing the number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Based off of that. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say that. Like, it seems <laughs> very unlikely that it's that low. Like, that's lower than, like, most colleges, like, yeah. significantly like lower. Lower than Stanford's yeah. acceptance rate. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm even more intrigued to that. So, like, when you talk about, like, Stanford and, like, you know, Berkeley and all the big ones, like, they have a system in place, which is you, you could sign up. It, what, what's it? Was it your SAT score uh, mm -hmm. that you need to submit on that? But what what do you submit to a boot camp? What, what do they require for you to be able to be accepted into the program? Um, I know that Hack Reactor has a, a very lightweight technical interview that they make you do in order to get into the program. Okay, even if you've never had any like previous uh, experience in mm -hmm. any of the tech stuff. Mm -hmm. They'll give you like some prep material to look at and it's basically just like the fundamentals of JavaScript or some basic HTML. And they, they'll test you on that because if, if you're not able to kind of pick up on that um, before you show up, you're, you're gonna be in a pretty bad place. That actually makes sense because it's like the first level of filtering, for example. It's mm -hmm. like the first level of like, you know, making sure that you're talking to somebody who can start the ball rolling uh, just to get it with the momentum and everything. And um, and I'm guessing is that like a quite standard approach for most of the other boot camps out there is that they'll always start with like a phone screen or something and then just go through a couple of questions. Yeah, I think App Academy has a similar model as well. That's actually pretty cool because that's already quite realistic too, I guess. <laughs> Common interview question. When we're talking about like most of the time the first phase, like it doesn't always have to be a technical question. It just needs to prove that you're into the technical mindset and like loving to build stuff out of, out of nothing um actually stan what would be your position out is if you had to start a boot camp what would be um how long would you join a boot camp what would be the criteria for you to join a boot camp given your point of view because obviously you know a bit more mature after the years how, how would you perceive that like how long do i think someone needs to be in a program to be proficient in like a software engineering role yeah, if somebody's going to start today, like, what's the best timeline? Like, how long should they go into the boot camp? Whether it be three months, like, half a year, 12 months, and how much should they spend on that boot camp? Would be the best value and efficiency coming out of it? It's tough to say. I mean, different people have different aptitudes. Like, you know, if you're a slower learner, you probably need more time. I, I will say this. I definitely think three months is too short. <laughs> I think there's still a lot of information missing, even for, like, an entry-level position that boot camp grads 
uh, need to fill in themselves, I'm guessing, after their, their three months of their boot camp is up. Um, yeah. Uh, and so if... greater than three months, let's just say that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's actually good, uh, cool, because the things, like, a lot of times what I think about is that, like, if I give myself today, right, and um, I find myself, I want to learn something new, this new technology, I want to be super good at whatever, Scala. I keep on mentioning that example because for some reason I feel like I want to be good at Scala. <laughs> um, what would my criteria be for joining a boot camp? So in terms of length, like three months for me is ideal just because as you were saying, it's not like the biggest commitment. You don't lose a year, you don't lose a year and a half to do it. But then like the other counterpoint as I was mentioning is that like you might not get all the information of being the most proficient. But then again, I could take that, the fact that I have a couple of experience of programming, so that kind of helps with me. Uh, but yeah, I always like to think from my point of view is that like, how long do I want to get into a program for, but also how much I want to spend. So if we talk about just like the cost nowadays of like these boot camps, uh, comparison, I went to uni, uh, three years in Canada cost me probably like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, I'd say. This is like, I guess, low ball compared to America, but how do we compare with boot camps? Because I guess that's a compar direct comparison. So for me, university, three years, three and a half, four years, depending on uh, if you're in the States or if you've done a year before. That's around, I guess, 20K. What numbers are we seeing for, uh, I guess, the pathway of going into boot camps nowadays? Like the price of the boot camp? How much was Hack Reactor when you went? I think it was 17, 18 grand. So more than your entire yeah. university. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> but, but actually, to think about it, though, is that like, I want to tie back to the fact that there's these different paths, right? So one, one path that I took is three years, four years, university, and then the other path is three months going into it. Price is a little bit more on the coding bootcamp side. It's not that much more, but in terms of like how much time I spent on it and like how much more information I got at university compared to that, that's one of the comparison points. But if the goal is to be able to get a junior engineering job, if you look like very, very, very high level, you end up with the same task. Uh, you end up with the same goal at the end by doing these two paths of paying whatever between 15 20 25 grand for a certification to get into that um should people be expecting to be paying that much for boot camps nowadays or is there some other way of not having to pay that much for three months of knowledge yeah i think they've got like income sharing agreements where um, you don't pay anything initially but then once you get your job you give them a certain percentage of your uh, your paychecks for a year or two but that usually ends up costing a lot more than either like taking out a loan to pay to pay it up front or just paying in cash. Yeah. So like if I put in like a more simple way for me to understand is that like you're going to do the program for free. But then when you come out, a chunk of your salary is going to be paid to them uh, every, I guess, every paycheck or whatever. That I've never really thought about it that way. But yeah, I kind of agree with you that in the long run, do they usually tell you like, oh, the first five year after you graduate, that's how much we take from you or yeah, they tell you up front. It's usually for like a year or two. They'll take like 15%, 20%, something like that. But when you come out uh, with the job and everything, that um, that number that I think about, because I'm trying to see, I always love numbers. I'm a sucker for numbers at the end of the day. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that would be good if they managed to get you a job to begin with and if you end up getting a, a software engineering salary in the Bay Area. So that's going to cover it. Um, What happens if you don't i'm sorry i'm being a, a bit grim here though. like what happens if you come out of here you 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 have that agreement right they gave you all the, the whole course for free and then you come out of there and you don't really like end up finding anything is there any fallback cases well what's the usual scenario there yeah they usually have something in the contract saying that you have to actually try for a certain amount of time after you graduate so like i think it's like a year or something like that but then after that if you're actually trying and you're not able to get a job then you're you're off the hook i mean that makes sense Where, what else are they gonna do i guess you're not going to start bagging groceries and it'll take like 15% of every time you bag a grocery, can they? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking, thinking out loud here. Like, and let, let's be specific, that's specifically for the Bay Area region, right? Or is that kind of a similar approach for, I guess, like most boot camps that you would find in different parts of the U.S. as well? I think a lot of boot camps offer that kind of uh, payment program now. It's it's because okay. for most people that go to boot camp, they're they're a little bit um, older. They usually have established careers and they're looking to change. Um, so for them to pay upfront for a to to like take time off of work to look for a job they might not get, that's usually a pretty big risk. Like it's safer to take the income sharing if you if you if you're not that confident that the program will work out. 
Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So they don't fully like you know risk everything. Mm -hmm. I think it's 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 good. I'm not sure in terms of like the percentage whether they're gouging these students too much, but if you just think about it in terms of alignment and incentives, right, then the boot camp is also very incentivized for you to actually find a job afterwards, as opposed to if you paid up front, they already have your money. Like, there's not as much incentive to actually get you that job afterwards. Um, so it kind of puts them a little bit more on the hook. Nice. So it's, to get paid. <laughs> yeah, it's like this shared responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So they they're also responsible for getting you a job to coming out of it and then you're also responsible to to do that i the more i think about it is this like what i can't think of the downside what what are the downsides of this, so far of these boot camps like we mentioned like the bit of the bit of a lot of money going into it uh spending to do that but then we just mentioned this program that could help you with that and then the other one is time commitment are you able to think of any other like downsides to why somebody shouldn't be joining a boot camp at the end of the day stan I think it's a very case by case basis. Like if you think about it as like I just want to make more money and you're making, you know, like 40, 50k right now and the op and the opportunity cost of like quitting your 45, 40 to 50k job for 3 months, probably more than 3 months I'm guessing, uh to look for a software engineering role that potentially pays six figures, that easily seems worth it, but if you're coming from a field that, you know, uh, already pays you six figures and then potentially you're taking a pay cut for it and you're I'm guessing you might be going to the boot camp for a different reason like maybe you just really don't like the career path that you've chosen I don't know it's it, I feel like it's very it's a very case-by-case -case basis whether it's worth it for someone to do it or not yeah I think what you just mentioned speaks like yeah it is case by case but it does speak to a lot of people like the example mm -hmm. I just described a lot of people can relate to that yeah. position and uh, when we say the upfront cost, like for example, yeah, you'll pay 15K, 20K to get into it. It gives you an opportunity that you wouldn't be able to even try for before, right? Yeah. So like you're, same thing at the end of the day, it's an investment. Uh, it's, it's still a gamble because you're not guaranteed, but at least you got people or organizations, these groups that back you up to, to do it, right? Yeah, I do think like, I will say this, I think like, a lot of people look at it from a money perspective, but you also should consider the career like satisfaction <laughs> uh, dimension as well, like in your in your decision. Because like I think if you don't enjoy doing what you do, you'll probably not pr progress very far in terms of your career. Like even in software engineering, like maybe you'll just kind of stay kind of close near the entry level yeah they salary like the entire time so maybe there won't it won't be like the skyrocketed like salaries that you see that netflix pays that you get one day yeah you really don't like what you're doing hey shout out to netflix <laughs> um, yeah but um this is actually a good transition to it because like if we talk about the boot camp itself now because a lot of the stuff that we just brought up is like even before joining the boot camp there's so many consideration that people have to do uh to reflect on themselves and seeing do i want to dive into it but now like if you have taken this you know conviction of doing it you're you're in the position that you've signed up you've done your phone screening it all went well and like all the all the finances in check like you're in a good prone position to go into it um we could definitely talk about the boot camp itself then in terms of what what exactly is the boot camp so if we kind of break it down like for the first i guess the first impressions and the first time going into it um i guess what was the general vibe andy the first week let's say from the th from the 12 weeks that you got the first week one week two what, what was that general feeling going on um at hack reactor it was pretty cool like the staff there they're um incredibly uh nice like we kind of have two kinds of uh instructors there one is more of like a technical instructor and the other one is more of like a i don't know like a maybe culture instructor uh, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how to put it but then um, like a camp counselor exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. very close to that I've i actually, I actually been think they were called, ca called counselors <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> It's so funny because I was a camp counselor for like three years, but obviously not for coding boot camp. I was just a summer day camp for kids or whatever. So are you saying that they're, the counselors there are kind of like the reality checks and like life coach kind of kind of people as opposed to like you have the actual instructor that teaches the balance of all the technical stuff? Yeah, that, 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 that split sounds accurate. That is actually sick. So you so um, just get the picture right is that you end up joining in first few weeks. You're with a group of 20, 30 people. And there's, is it mainly the two instructors that you're going to be with for the whole, uh, I guess, 12-week program? Yeah, so we have, like, a main, like, technical instructor and a main, like, counselor. 
Um, but there are also graduates from previous classes that help out as well, almost like as TAs. And we do have some, some other instructors that provide the lectures that have like plenty of industry experience and are incredibly uh, knowledgeable. Oh, wow. So the thing, the, the more you describe it, the more it sounds like they're trying to imitate like a, like a actual course in university. So, I mean, it's not gonna, you're not going to have a counselor looking over that, but when we're talking about like a main instructor, which is like the actual prof doing it, and then you got all these TAs coming in to support with the, uh, with the grading and all that kind of fun stuff. Is, so did you feel like it was more like a you know, classroom setting then? Did it feel like going to university again? Or was, it, or was there some other vibe where it's like, oh, they got um, free food and like foosball tables and like more of the startup be kind? Well, what did it look like, I guess? Yeah, the layout was like a typical startup open office layout there wasn't any foosball unfortunately but um yeah okay, all right you just lost like half the people yeah. now like they're not gonna not gonna do it anymore <laughs> and then like in terms of uh did you had to do like what eight hours a day there or was it just like part-time a uh, couple days a week yeah i want to say i spent like around um 10 hours a day there like the uh class would usually start around uh nine i think it'd end around like seven or eight that is quite intensive like mm -hmm. now that i think about it it's not as crazy as i think it's only 12 weeks like for example like when 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 i went to uni um there were weeks where in a day i would have like one day off or like there would be semesters that i'd have like four courses instead of five and then like uh, i would have like three hours of course in a day another so is it still fair to compare i guess that that 12 weeks is a lot shorter than a regular university degree or am I, am I not getting the numbers right here? I mean, I think in terms of like hours spent doing stuff, it's probably closer to like the hours you spend in university that, that, that you're thinking about. But um, there is only so much information you can pick up in a certain amount of time, regardless of how much hours you spend during that time. Okay. Yeah. Cause 10 hours, <laughs> I don't know about you, but 10 hours is a lot to me. Like what, what do I do for 10 hours at the end of the day? <laughs> um, and I think I just want to tie into a point before where we're saying like during this phase, um, I think Stan mentioned that like this might not be the path for somebody or like sometimes they realize that when they do this, like uh, if they don't have the passion for it, that they don't want to like go all the way for it, you might not be the most successful in that. Did you see anybody like drop out during this phase, I guess, very early immature phase of uh, getting into that journey? Yeah, I think there are several people that like self-selected themselves out. And there's also kind of like a weekly assessment that we have that like if you fail enough of these you'll you'll be recycled to a previous class or eventually kicked out okay so there's that pressure still of uh doing that so what what does a weekly assessment mean it's usually just like a um almost like a project that you work on for like a couple hours that goes over the topics that um were taught during that week so like one assessment could be like making a simple backend server, one could be like making a simple React, uh, a um, React app. I'm trying to see, is that reflective of how good of an engineer is? Do you think if somebody puts out like a React, create React project within a week, would that be a good indicator of how they're going to be in their day-to-day -day life today, Stan? Well, when I say day-to-day -day life as a software engineer that we've been for the past couple, couple of years. I think it could be a reasonable assessment. I mean, if the difficulty probably varies from person to person again. Like some people have probably created React apps in their own time and maybe they're they're at the boot camp with a little more experience and maybe it's easier, but they still all get scored in the same standardized way, I imagine. Like, do does their project meet these technical specs? And I don't know. If if you're failing to learn at a reasonable rate, I could see that being like enough of a criteria to potentially filter someone out from the software engineering role because there is so much active learning in every well most software engineers uh, lives you're always picking up new languages new frameworks reading about new technologies um, yeah yeah but also like I'm gonna speak for some experience from the past couple of years that sometimes like you do see people uh, do see people end up being in a stack for a project and like the stack never changes and they end up being just using that all the time and Anything new and extra is that they have to do it on their own time or they have to suggest like some other path to include it into their own, own technology. So that's the kind of like the way I see sometimes that like if you get caught into a stack forever and ever and ever, that's the point where you got to be your own proactive way of learning a new technology. 
Um, I mean, there's stuff to learn even outside of like a new language, right? There's always like new language feature features, like programming languages will come out with different versions with new features and you might want to stay up to date on those and actually maybe actively use some of the more useful ones for your projects. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of really do like that. So if we bring back to the emphasis, um, uh, if you join a bootcamp in the modern times of you know the past couple of years, what kind of technologies that they started throwing out uh, to, to you guys just because you know there are some that are more relevant in the current workforce today? I think there's a... Actually, I think the curriculum is probably identical to what it was when I went there right now. I mean, the stack we used was uh, fairly hip and modern. So like it's definitely still being used now. It's like Node with Express and like some sort of SQL database, like Mongo, React, Angular. It's all and all that stuff is still being used today. That that's pretty sick. How do you feel about MongoDB stack? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's okay, <I> started. <laughs> all right, all right. That's another episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's actually good because like it really touches everything and uh, that ecosystem. Shout out to JavaScript because that has dominated in the past couple of years. When I went to uni, um, we did loads of C and loads of like, I'm gonna love Java in there, but it's just, I feel like these <laughs> these technologies are not as prominent anymore. Ja like, shout out to Java as well, because like Java is very like still prominent nowadays, but if you talk about just raw C, like it's very rare to be able to get into a more modern company that still uses it, unless you go to like more, you know, structured, old school like bank companies where some of them still run on COBOL and some of them still run on Fortran and all those kind of older language languages. That I guess is a major distinction between the boot camps that you're describing nowadays that they'll throw in, you know, Angular, which is like a newer thing. As opposed to when when I went through the whole program, I was like, C, all right, yeah, let's learn everything about it. And nowadays like I don't even know how to compile a C program anymore, which is like, okay, how did that turn out this way? <laughs> um, Maybe that tells a lot about how I went through uni. <laughs> but the other comparison that I want to bring up is that in uni, they would give you loads of books. The amount of like you know money that university students spends on book and everything. What kind of resources that they give you or you have to like get when you you know go through a coding boot camp like this? They were actually pretty uh, bare because like fortunately now you can you can Google everything and just look 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 stuff up on Stack Overflow. So like the actual curriculum they provided. Um, there wasn't that much content and explanation there. Like one big thing was to actually get us to kind of look up answers by ourselves by like Googling. Wait, do we Google every day when we do our jobs? <laughs> that is, um, that is, I don't know. I'm just gonna say accurate. As in like the, the way they, they do is that like, they don't force you to always rely on this one book that tells you how to write functions, you know, like they, they teach you how to be more flexible and, uh, how to Google. I'm, I'm going to admit it, like Googling, like you got to know how to do that to be, to be a software engineer at the end of the day, as much as people uh, may, may or may not agree with that. Um, yeah, I just want to say that I kind of appreciate that he put the emphasis on that. So back to this point where it's like, this is just the first few weeks, by the way, this is kind of like the first impressions of like when you got in. Um, so you're saying there was actually a good, what, handful of people that dropped out, I guess, after, after a while or? Yeah, I want to say a little under 10, I think. Out of my class. Oh wow, that's significant. Are you like this? Is just back thirty. I think we or ended with ten 30. out of so thirty out of forty finished it, or twenty five out of like thirty five. I think so. Yeah. Because hmm. that is quite like a like a good chunk, right? If you think about it, even even to begin getting into the program, we're seeing that the acceptance rate, as skeptical as it is of like one percent or like point one percent, we'll we'll you know give a bit of doubt on that. So out of the people that actually got into program, even a good chunk of that don't even like go through with, with the thing. Speculatively, do you know why would somebody, I guess, not finish it? Other than the fact that they realize that it's not for them or. Yeah, that's basically it. I think if, if they think that it's not for them because I don't know, like the hours are incredibly long, maybe, maybe they're not willing to commit the amount of, the amount of time to do this stuff, then yeah, I mean, if, 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 if they weren't like technically capable like uh, the program gives them a lot of opportunities to retry. Like they can stay in the program for several classes if they wanted to. Okay. So, like, until... It's usually just like self-selecting more or less. Yeah. Okay. Until they get more comfortable in, which is where this like counselor position kind of comes in where mm -hmm. they kind of help them. Cause I'm guessing it's a very mental thing at the mm -hmm. end of the day. It's kind of nuts though that like they'll, 
it's not nuts. I'm saying it's a positive thing that they have somebody to make sure that your mentality is still there going through this boot camp because they know it's like more intensive. I suppose to uni, I don't know if you guys had a lot of like mental like help from from school, but I feel like when you have a university of like fifty thousand people, how many of them actually get this like motivational people going back at it and be like, you could do it, you could go through the whole program. So, did you wish you had that during university, Stan? Having somebody like a counselor, like a life coach, as you went through uh, the experience. Yes. Well, I went to public school, so I don't think <laughs> they could afford something like that, even if they wanted to. <laughs> yeah, but... I don't think it hurt to have a cheerleader on your side to get through some of those classes, but Dude, you yeah, we been pour a... out here. In the <laughs> <UC> system. <laughs> you could have been a billionaire if you had somebody just cheer you on. I'm kidding, though. You're still going to make it, trust me. <laughs> um, and also, um, the other thing that I want to mention is that, like, past this first stage, so, like, yeah, great, you got the ball rolling already. This is the first, you know, few weeks. Then you're in the middle chunk of the middle chunk of the boot camp where, you know, you're already sweating a bit if we compare it to, like, an actual physical boot camp, like burpees and push-ups and all that. You're in the middle of it. You're already sweating. What kind of, um, we talked about weekly assignments, but was there anything slightly bigger than that? Was there something that is, like, a project that you had ongoing for a couple of weeks yeah, that was usually in like the uh, second half of the boot camp. We have like a uh, capstone project. Okay. That we usually spend like I don't know, like four or five weeks on. I I I want to talk about teams here. Is that like an individual team, or is that like you had to rely on other people in that, in that yeah, group? Yeah, yeah. You basically had to rely on other people. Um, when when I went to Hack Reactor, we uh, I think our project was to emulate like a back end system. Okay. And kind of like design it with like databases, service oriented architecture, all that good stuff. And you have like three other people on your team. Do you get to choose them or do you get, uh, do you just get tossed, lobbed into it? They're randomly chosen. Oh. Reminds me of college. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say like, if you wanted, you, did they let you choose or is it literally just throw? No, it's, it's, it's all randomly chosen, but I was fortunate enough to get like really good people. I was going to say, because like the, um, the, the fact that this is all happening in the Bay Area is that, like, a lot of these people that you end up meeting might end up being something bigger down the line. Uh, some Something that, like, you know, when you have these founders that say, like, oh, yeah, we met at the this boot camp or we met at this, like, Hacker News thing kind of thing. I think this is what we're talking about. It's these moments that, like, you end up getting tossed into these teams that you never really expected yourself to be in. And then you'd be like, oh, yeah, we can make something work at the end. Um, how was your team experience in uni, <laughs> I can speak for my, my team experience in uni. I, I, I always keep on saying that I haven't been always the best one out there, but I do understand that like the work has is not always spread even. There's always the people that end up not doing enough, and there's always people that do more and then bitch about it after. <laughs> um, <laughs> was that similar to what you what you think, Stan? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's still regardless, I think that that's like a good way to actually it's good practice for real life because oftentimes you don't always choose your coworkers and your peers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have like, uh, you might have some in influence in terms of determining who you work with, but you'll probably still work with people that you consider good and people that you consider not so good. So it's good practice for that regardless. I think it's good to experience it. That's actually a good push. So this is even a, an even more emphasis on people that are considering, should I do a boot camp? Not only do you get the actual knowledge of the content, which is whatever, if it's a web bootcamp, then you'll be doing web. But then this extra aspect of, you know, you get the chance to meet somebody that you never expected to work with. And then if that experience of working with other people ends up being bigger because you get tossed into teams, as Stan was saying, that you never expected. And sometimes you do enjoy being on a team with people that actually ends up being working really well. So I think that's an extra bonus for people considering doing this. Definitely add that onto the list. Um, I like how that way we describe like the middle chunk of like the, the boot camps that like that's when you start forming these teams, this bigger project. And if we go to the last, I guess the last bit of the boot camp, the last few weeks, I guess what was the general sentiment? Was everybody like super optimistic at that point? Or were they all like beat up and like fed up and ready to, to be done with the boot camp? <laughs> um, like the like the last half is definitely a little bit slower pace than the first half because it's a lot less learning, more just applying what you learn on mm -hmm. the uh on the capstone project but the end of the boot camp is typically just preparing for the job search so it's like getting getting your resume ready and reviewed um classes on how to beat the interview process <laughs> <laughs> hey next time i'm gonna shove my podcast in there and then they'll have a definite plug into it um so they managed to do that in parallel so i guess like a, maybe like a month before the end of the program that's where this kind of stuff happens or do they always have like a weekly checkup on how your i guess profile looks like 
Yeah, there were small items scattered here and there. Like we would start our resumes um, at the, uh, I think it was like in the middle of the uh, course. But then um, the final week of the boot camp is, is dedicated to uh, job searching only. Oh, as, 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 like, week, as yeah. like learning, learning about it. That's actually really cool. Because um, it would be kind of a shame if you did the whole 12 weeks and you didn't touch any aspect of it. You'd be like, oh yeah, good luck out there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is basically university, by the way. I'm, I'm going to speak for my case that, like, by the end of your three, four-year degree, I don't know if everybody goes out there confident enough to be like, I'm going to be able to apply to, like, 50 different roles um, if you haven't done that extra effort yourself during your university time. It wasn't part of my curriculum to be prepping myself to be able to talk to everybody out there and, like, showing a really good profile. They do have services for it. They do suggest you do it. But it wasn't actually ingrained, like ingrained into the actual concept. So I think that's really, really cool that they do that for the uh, boot camps. And I think just like since we're talking about this final sprint that we're going into it, do you, do you think that it was like it's fair to say that it's quite accurate? How realistic that whole program is to your day to day life today as a you know full time great software engineer? That was extremely accurate. I I think like the the parts when we were working on the capstone projects. That's like more or less normal software engineering what is though no, okay <laughs> what is that okay that that is good um i don't even know why i'm the one saying it's good or not like it sounds good at the end of, i don't know why i'm the one judging this you guys like went through like an like a like a phase where you like kind of plan things out and then like you'd actually distribute the tasks and mm -hmm. people would code them up you guys use like version control and everything mm -hmm. while building it that's mm -hmm. that's very impressive yeah, <laughs> yeah most yeah. of most college like uh, CS projects that I worked on, usually by myself. Uh, sometimes I use version controls, just like commits by myself. So yeah. <laughs> I never actually learned how to use like Git very well because of that. <laughs> yeah, I think Git is one of the things that like you, it definitely needs to be hands on. Like as many theory class that people explain you what is a branch like to actually learn Git, you gotta you gotta use it use it as much as you can. Um, I really like when you brought up Stan that like not only is the software engineer responsible for actually just writing code, but they're also responsible to be able to del delegate tasks and, uh, you know, more of a product vision to it. See, like, who needs to work on what kind of thing. Mm -hmm. did, they, did they put more of that hat on you as well? As in, like, yes, you're a group of people who are trying to be software engineers. Did they ever bring in people to be, like, product managers, designers, anything to kind of complement the, the whole flow of, you know, nowadays we deal with a lot of that? So they didn't do that um, specifically. Like they definitely explained all the roles out and told them that we should be using it in our group projects, but then they kind of left us to ourselves to kind of actually carry that out and uh, try to enforce the rules. So it was actually rather interesting. Like I think my team did exceptionally well. Like we, we, we were really good at following the rules, uh, the planning and all that stuff. We, we were actually able to finish our project like a week or two before like we were supposed to. Um, but then it was interesting seeing the dynamics of some other teams because like there's like no cohesion in that at all Like you know, it <laughs> definitely would have been good if the instructors played a more active role because like and some of the projects were a mess They had like four identical endpoints that had like their names appended to it <laughs> Restful, huh? Yeah, they really emphasize that yeah. <laughs> That would look like my team if it's like that's how my team looks like nowadays, right? You have like any team going on and then they stand still you can see my team are just like spinning the circles and that like tricycles and like trying to do wheelies on one end and be like hey <laughs> but appending your name to a, a an AP. <laughs> this is mine i wrote yeah. this because version control doesn't exist <laughs> yeah. no sorry it's gonna be stat underscore 1.1 1. 1. like yeah. it's gonna that, that's gonna leave a comment with my with my github handle on every yeah. line that i wrote <laughs> oh my god that's actually really cool i'm actually upset i haven't really seen any of that in like my my learning journey at the end that's a great example maybe yeah, it's a good thing that you didn't see that yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe i've seen that, i just didn't realize it maybe i was the one producing all that kind of stuff and i didn't notice any of that blind to your own mistakes <laughs> yeah do you have any other good nuggets like that i absolutely love that one yeah i'm trying to think i don't know like i've definitely seen people like butt heads and stuff like kind of unnecessarily yeah i mean that happens in the real world too yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. fair yeah it seems pretty similar it's, it's a good good uh imitation of the real world 
I was gonna say it's healthy. Well, it's healthy if it's justifiable, because I do mm-hmm. know that if there are people going into a you know debate or whatever, and then you clearly know whatever their their founding base is completely wrong and not justified, it's pointless. Like most of the time, people are gonna get more frustrated and yet nothing done. But if we talk about healthy discussions, then everybody ha- tries to have a point and they try to justify it, and they've done their own you know due diligence, uh, due diligence, sorry, to like actually back their point. Then yeah, that's exactly realistic to what we do nowadays. But um, at the end of the day, you gotta agree on something. So. I'm really impressed that like you managed to get saying your team that you know you had a good team on that uh, going through that that experience. So that kind of really wraps up the whole boot camp uh, experience itself, which I think I've personally learned a lot just because I haven't seen it from like that point of view. Um, but then this is the, the you know the point after it. This is we're talking about post boot camp now. This actually how, did they did they grade you? Do you get like a number grade or do you get like a letter grade by the time you come out of it, or, or, or does everybody just end up getting the same certification? Yeah, you basically complete the program. Um, I wouldn't say they give you a uh, certification because it's not really certified by anyone. Mm-hmm. So um, you really just leave with like the knowledge you gain. Okay. and But the things like the knowledge you gain is reflected on the projects you've built and is re- reflected by these, like I guess, the portfolio that you've been building mm-hmm. for the past couple of weeks doing it. All right, so that's pretty cool because uh, when you graduate uni, a lot of people get a freaking score. <laughs> 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 I mean, I keep, I, I, I keep on talking about it. Um, I... I don't rem- I don't think I've ever applied to a job that required me to uh, provide my score at the end. Is that still a thing in the Bay Area where people ask you for your your um, what's that score called? It's not the RCA. The yeah, that one. I clearly don't remember. Anything, but do they still do it nowadays? Probably for new grads, like if they have no experience. Yeah, I remember during like career fairs, there would be certain like more like high tier companies that would actually have like a minimum GPA requirement for like specific internships and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. So this is another point of comparison is that like if you end up doing the university program, you could come out with a GPA and then if they know you went to university, they can ask you for it. As opposed to you come out from a boot camp, they're not gonna be able to ask you for your GPA because that's the GPA might not be the relevant thing of what you did. Um, some people might see that as an advantage. Some people might not. I think I think it's an advantage because I've never been a fan of people asking for like GPAs and stuff. So, was well, your GPA good or <laughs> yeah. bad? <laughs> yeah, we're not getting into that. Uh, <laughs> but um, if we get back to all right, post boot camp. So you come out with it. You got these like proof uh, portfolio, all that. The job search bit is probably what is the most important stuff for the um, person coming to the program. So. When we're talking about the last week, I guess, it's still tied in. How, how exactly did they help you? Did the program help in terms of, like, uh, set you up with interviews with companies already? Or did they just tell you, oh, uh, these are the different popular job boards that are uh, very common for tech companies? Like, what kind of other approach did they go with? Um, they basically help you out um, by, like, kind of showing you some structure on how to conduct your job search. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, like, mock interviews they do. There's... Um, there's like resume reviewing and like um, you get access to a career counselor for I think a year after you graduate as well. Oh, wow. That's so, so, so they're super helpful in that. And like in terms of referring us to companies, that was one thing I was a little bit sus about the program too because like it says in the curriculum that they offer like a career fair or something and then attending this career fair is a uh, requirement for graduation. But mm-hmm. that never happened for my class. I don't think it happened for any of the classes I've heard about. <laughs> all right yeah that, that definitely sounds, sounds, sounds like a class action law yeah. <laughs> well i mean like if it's a big bag. yeah i was gonna say if it's big enough you get the free course all the baggage that you get yeah. for free and then you get that paid off as well so that's actually pretty jokes um so yeah it's comparable there's always the, the career fairs and like um it's stuff that they tell you to join whether you're doing a coding boot camp or a university boot camp at the end um is that are they, are they expecting that to be the most successful case? Because I'm seeing this from personal experience that like, I ended up getting my first job not through a career fair, not through a coding bootcamp. Do you think most of the people that graduate those programs is that is the 95% path that people have taken to successfully get a job or has people just end up being like, no, I'm just going to go apply on my own and figure it out? Oh, the, the only way is to apply on your own for, for, for the coding bootcamp. They, they, don't, they don't help you up with the job. Oh, okay. They, they, they just give you the skills that you need and like the tools you need. Okay, so they're not going to hand-in-hand set you up directly with a recruiter and everything. That's still on you to reach mm-hmm. out and do all of that. They don't give you referrals to any of the companies that they work with? Um, there were, like, sponsorships and whatnot? Like... They used to have that, yeah. I think they used to have, like, a program with, like, um, Uber where they would 
yeah, where, where, where they just give you the take home right away. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go through a uh, recruiter, but I think they've gotten rid of that now, unfortunately. And the reasons with that would probably be, be because there's too many grads or, because the thing is like, that's come one of the reasons that like, if they don't have these programs, they can't guarantee everybody coming out of it, will have time to even set up an interview for that. Or is there some, I guess, thing that you guys could think of why they don't offer specific partnerships with, I guess, major companies? It's probably difficult. Like, yeah. <laughs> My what... guess would be like, because like, there are so many prior, maybe back in the day, like a long time ago, you a person attending like a coding boot camp was like a good signal that they mm-hmm. were like hardworking and that they were like fairly high aptitude. And if companies saw that, they're like, well, we don't have to screen as many applicants. We know like there's like a pretty good chance this pool of applicants at this coding boot camp are pretty good. So they might again like have a sponsorship and then just pull directly from that pool of applicants. But now there's so many of them, and potentially uh, it's harder to say whether like maybe the quality of the applicant that completes like a boot camp isn't as consistent anymore. Maybe that's why they've like cut those sponsorships. It's just like, it's not financially, uh, like a financially like reasonable thing for the companies to do anymore. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the underlying assumption has probably changed like mm-hmm. over over the years as we go. That's, that's a great point I brought up there because we always have this thing when we talk about comp side degrees, like it gets, you no know, stale mature and like it gets oversaturated and a lot of people coming out of it and it's not even a like, guarantee anymore that if you come out of a comp degree that you're guaranteed to be going to these top companies and all that um and i guess right now it's still pretty good if you go to a coding boot camp like i think it's still lively thrively and like a lot of people going through it might you know have a better rate on that i think the question that i want to go up with is like what is the next thing after that so you see this transition of like people going this comp side degree and then these programs that are more professional coding boot camps of that. Can you guys imagine like what's the next thing after that to make it more accurate for I guess you know bigger companies to be oh this is going to be a better ind- indicator than having a major pool of people coming out of coding boot camps to assess how good they are going to be in a real life scenario. I think someone could create like a more exclusive coding boot camp. I think a lot of the existing ones like Hack Reactor have potentially lowered the standard to accepting applicants for the sake of making money, right? Mm. Like the the more applicants you get, like the more money that you get. So it's obviously, they're financially incentivized to actually allow more people in. Um, But I don't know, maybe there's like a, maybe there's some medium there where um, you could create a coding bootcamp that's a lot more exclusive, make sure you vet like the applicants actually are high aptitude and are highly motivated individuals before you accept them into that program. And then maybe companies will come back and start sponsoring uh, boot camps again. Um, I imagine there's probably like some interesting like financial aspects like with that type of system because you could probably offset some of like the students uh, tuition for these boot camps if companies were also sponsoring you as a boot camp. Um, because they want to pull applicants directly from your pool first. Like maybe they get first dibs or something off of those people. Yeah, it kind of sounds like the drafts, right? Like the, the sports yeah. drafts, like first dibs on that. Yeah. I, I really do like when you brought up the, the point of like for profit, right? Like when somebody does it for profit, it's because if you look at the numbers, like a linear, you know, increases that the more applicants get, the more the program gets uh, all these, you know. Yeah, it's a business at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then when you spin it off for the, if we t- look at it from a nonprofit perspective, so if you take a very prominent figure at one of the bigger companies and they're like, I just want to have this course for the purpose of knowledge and not financial, that at the end of the day will be a better indicator if anybody wants to get a pool of those people because they know they're going into it, not for, you know, the, the money purpose. Not just the people paying for the program, but the people that are running pro- the program can afford it. I heard recently Google had like a free course that they're going to put online. I don't know if you guys like saw it on the news recently. Um, I don't know how exclusive it is, uh, if anybody could, you know, sign up for it. But I think that kind of echoes the feeling that if Google is going to put up a exclusive program, if it is exclusive, they kind of, I guess, hope that from there they get the first pick, right? They get to get the good people out of it and then they'll be able to invest into them. And it's like a really long term investment, which a bigger company can do. I actually heard. Amazon had they released like a machine learning course, but like the their incentive to do something like that, they wrote like a medium post on it was basically they were noticing they were hiring a lot of machine learning people, but it took them a while to actually ramp up the machine learning engineers at Amazon. 
and they're like, well, what if we just release the course or if that we help our existing like Amazon machine learning engineers, uh, they generally take this course for like, I'm guessing like a few weeks to like maybe a couple months. If we released it out, people might actually take the course and then they come into <laughs> Amazon and then they save themselves some time, right? Oh, like yeah. you save yourself maybe two months worth of like this, this engineer's like salary because they're immediately productive because they've already gone through it. So. Dude, um, these companies are bloody genius, man. They're outsourcing their training nowadays. <laughs> yeah, like to save themselves some training time. <laughs> it's good. It's it's very intelligent of them. It's and like, it's good for everyone else because now you're also exposed to like kind of Amazon, like very like, uh, they're obviously like a very high, very good company engineering wise. So you get to see like their standards and how they think about problems and how they approach processes. Um, yeah, okay. I think it's good for everyone. That's actually a good point because uh, the knowledge like, it, it's free, right? When you put it out yeah, there, it's democratize like, it. <laughs> yeah, that is a great point. I can't believe we're saying good things about Amazon, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've done good and bad things. We're not going to be biased over here, but yeah, as in like the side effect is benefiting a whole community, but I guess their purpose at the end of the day was that the training, if they outsource it, not only is a business genius idea to do it. Yeah, and they but, probably have more applicants to fill like those positions as well. Like if the information is just out there, maybe you're interested in ML and you take their course and maybe you become like an ML engineer for them one day. Like they definitely have, there's a high demand for those, those types of engineers these days. I, I, I could definitely see a push for that kind of model of outsourcing that. If any other companies start doing it, like outs, uh, sorry, making it open source the way they train people and how they do it. I think that even that as a business idea would be great. I feel like we're dropping a lot of good stuff today. So <laughs> that's going to be sick. Um, and yeah, so this whole thing of like post boot camp of like, doing the job search, you have to do it on your own, but you do have resources to help you with that. Uh, you got the last week of your bootcamp to prep, like prep up and like make everything look pretty. Uh, if you guys want to know how to beat your coding interview, there's another episode that we dive into that. So that's going to have loads of information on it. I think the, the one, I guess one of the more final points I want to get into is uh, what do employers think about bootcamp graduates? Um, I think we're very fortunate that we have experienced that to see people who are trying to apply for jobs uh, from, uh, from coding bootcamps. So from employees' point of view, what are the, I guess, main idea that, uh, main impression? So first of all, we kind of got to a point where it's like, we're not really biased in terms of if you came from a boot camp or if you came from a university, because at the end of the day, you got to know which, what you do, right? Are there any other kind of like major points that, uh, you know, employers would think about when they see somebody and when they know that they came from a coding boot camp? I think the uh, general consensus is still negative against coding boot camp grads now. Hmm. I don't know if it's negative per se. I again, I kind of think of it in terms of like the greatest. There's like a spectrum. Like mm -hmm. if you graduated from like a really top university, that doesn't necessarily mean you're really good at that job, like mm -hmm. whatever role you're applying for. But it does give me some idea that there's a higher chance that your aptitude might be higher. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in terms of like a probability distribution, I might put it a little bit higher. Uh, if you like graduate technically from like a more exclusive coding boot camp, I might also put you a little bit higher. I think all of this is very useful for like resume screening. So maybe it could potentially help you get past that first step. But again, if you bomb like an in-person interview, like and if you don't have the skills to actually pass that, it doesn't really matter like whether whether you have something on your resume or not. And it goes all the way down to like even someone that hasn't gone to uh, coding boot camp hasn't necessarily graduated college um, even those types of people like if they just self-study it might be harder for them to get past the resume screening uh, phase mm -hmm. but if they do and they do well on the on the in-person interview like why wouldn't you hire that person like I don't know that makes sense yeah it sounds a lot of politics as opposed to the actual like well, I think there know. are visuals there's like some superficial visual mm -hmm. like <laughs> visual to like having like a coding boot camp. I, I don't have like a negative connotation around it when I see it, but like it doesn't necessarily mean that much either in my mind. It doesn't hold that much weight. Right. Yeah. It hasn't proven itself. It's the same thing as if you look at somebody with a degree, for example, unless it's like a full blown PhD in, you know, like computational whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like you'd probably assume that person more likely is better at a role that at like a maybe like uh, software engineering position than like someone straight out of a coding boot camp, but you know, maybe not like that's the thing It's again like a probability. They're probably more likely to be better 
Yeah. Um, I do like that. Uh, and then I we could def- I mean we could definitely spend hours talking about the impressions of how people feel people coming out of boot camps kind of thing. Uh, we've definitely covered like enough to have somebody make their own judgment on it. Uh, whether you know whether they're happy that they've done it or happy that they haven't done it. I guess the final question would be like worth it or not. Kind of like a yes or no thing. So Andy, I think overall coding boot camps uh, being so ingrained into it was it worth it or not worth it? Yeah, it was def- it was totally worth it for me. I went from uh, making like twenty three dollars an hour to uh, getting my first software engineering job that was like exactly six figures. That is crazy. That's such a good story. So yeah, that's good worth it. And for you, Stan, for the all the prospective people trying to you know whether career change or whatever, question for them sitting you know listening to this or, or not is it worth it or not worth it to do a boot camp for you know their their future. I think it's worth it for most people. Make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Like, make sure you're actually interested in the space, not just like enamored by the salary. <laughs> uh, but given that caveat, I think it's actually worth it. I think a lot of people would actually enjoy software engineering. I, I recommend it to a lot of people. That's great. And I think if I had to ask myself that, worth it or not worth it, I personally haven't done it, but from all the people that I've got to you know, meet and talk about boot camps, uh, I think it's definitely worth it just because of what Stan was echoing in terms of do it for the knowledge, do it for the fact that the skills that you acquired for it is not a useful skill for just one year after graduating, it's a useful skill for the rest of your life, basically. So at the end of the day, if you make it work, I would 100% say it's worth it. Well, I guess that kind of wraps up the episode. And uh, yeah, thanks again for being on the show, Stan, Andy, and uh, I'll catch you guys on the next one.